This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. Also, make sure to check out and subscribe to our YouTube original channel, UCTV Prime, available only on YouTube. Welcome to Conversations with History. My name is Jack Citrin, a political science professor here at the University of California, Berkeley, and joining me to act as interviewer is Professor Bob Price, who's the Associate Vice Chancellor for Research here. And our guest today is Harry Chrysler, uh, in the unusual position, since he's the host and creator of Conversation with History and being in the interviewee's chair. And we've both known Harry for many years, so we are looking forward to this opportunity to hear him speak about his life and his place in history. So Harry, let's begin. Where were you born and raised? Uh, I was born in uh, Galveston, Texas, and raised there until I went off to college. And how did your family come to be in Galveston? Uh, a long story, uh, at the turn of the century, that is the, uh, the 20th century, uh, German Jews in New York uh, became concerned that too many East European Jews were coming to New York City. And they, since they were farmers, they said, why don't we populate them in the Midwest? And so they chose Galveston as a port of entry for the Jews to uh, land and then immigrate to the Midwest where they uh, could become farmers and realize their potential. The movement fizzled uh, and a, a Jewish community, an Orthodox Jewish community, grew up in Galveston, Texas. So when uh, the war, World War, the war clouds uh, rose in Europe, both my father and my mother were brought by relatives who were already in Galveston uh, to uh, the United States, and my mother came from Poland in the mid to late 30s, and my father came from Vienna uh, after the Anschluss. So that's how I wound up being there. So your parents met in Galveston, and there that's was... correct. They met in Galveston, and they, uh, uh, my, uh, their siblings. It gets very confusing. I have to remember how this goes. But my <laughs> my uh, mother's sister married into the same family as did my father's brother, mm -hmm. and so it, it was a, a, a very uh, close knit community, uh, an Orthodox Jewish community. So, more broadly, how did this experience of your family escaping from the Nazis and then being in probably a relatively small Jewish community in this larger place. How did that affect your own thinking growing up and your interest in history? Well, well, I, uh, I think that uh, I uh, became very uh, aware of political events and uh, international crises uh, and so on. And uh, I, over time, learned the story of my father's coming. So it, it's a fascinating story in the sense that he was in Vienna after the Nazis occupied. And his brother went to the local rabbi, Rabbi Henry Cohen, who had been one of the organizers of the Galveston movement and, and one of its, its leading figures. And I think that because the congressional delegation was very powerful in Texas, uh, they were able to set in motion uh, 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 the circumstances that got my father a visa, because it was very hard, as you know, uh, uh, to get out uh, of Europe uh, as, as uh, war was breaking out in, uh, uh, in Europe. So I, I became very fascinated with, uh, with politics, uh, and uh, uh, I was mentored by uh, a contemporary who was an old-time Roosevelt liberal, mm -hmm. 
And so he indoctrinated me into the to the politics of liberal, and I became a uh, uh, a Texas liberal Democrat. But before that, you had, I think, some difficult childhood growing up. You lost your father when you were very young. What about that process? Well, how, my, well, my 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 father uh, died uh, of a heart attack when I was five. Uh, in in very uh, weird circumstances, he we he had a mom and pop grocery store which catered to medical students uh, because the medical student fraternities were nearby and they would buy their food at the grocery store. He became ill one day, and there were a number of medical students in the store, and so they uh, took him upstairs to our apartment, and I wandered into the scene. And then he, he subsequently died and was taken uh, to the hospital. So I never saw him again. So his his there were a lot of questions I never got to ask him, uh, and a lot of answers. And I think that kind of motivated me in the future. And my mother was left with the store. She her English was poor, and so we we grew up. My brother and I uh, under very difficult uh, financial circumstances, but. Always there was an emphasis on education and going to college, and so that was never in doubt. Well, you became active, in a way, in politics uh, while you were still pretty young, and uh, it, was there any particularly memorable incident that occurred to you while you were growing up? Uh, yeah, they, well, there were, there were several, but one in particular was I was, uh, believe it or not, the sports editor of the uh, the high school newspaper. This is hard to believe. Yes, it is <laughs> very, very hard. So what? Well, there was a controversial appointment of a new coach from ah. the Catholic school, uh, and the 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 the, high, the regular coach had been fired, and I got an exclusive interview with him because we knew somebody who knew somebody, <laughs> and the the high school paper ran a, a two page spread, which was very. Uh, controversial, and I was called into the principal's office. So that was one case where I already started actually doing this interview uh, thing. And then uh, uh, the other, uh, I was uh, uh, vice chairman of youth for Kennedy Johnson. And so uh, as a result, as part of that position, we were able to meet a number of the Democratic celebrities who came through. Uh, in particular, uh, uh, one incident that I remember very well is Bobby Kennedy came to Galveston uh, at the lo to the local airport. He landed in a private plane, and I was part of the delegation to meet him. And so he arrives, and there was a really distinguished group of bigwigs there. And so his pilot, when the plane land, turned the plane around. So Bobby came out the door uh, opposite the side of the plane where the dignitaries were waiting. So he comes out of the, the plane, and I, just by coincidence, happened to be on the wrong side. So the first person he saw was this <laughs> young <laughs> high school kid. And so Bobby looked at me with those steely eyes, and as if to say, who the hell are you, basically? And he said, where is Congressman Thompson? And I said, oh, he's on the other <laughs> side of the place. So that was my big encounter with Bobby Kennedy. <laughs> but that didn't... Uh spoil your lifelong admiration for John Kennedy. That's right. I was, uh, you know, you have to remember, I was in high school when Kennedy ran and was elected, and uh, he was very charismatic. He was very bookish in a, in a kind of, uh, 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 he was very well-educated, and so he was kind of a shining uh, example. And so uh, we worked in the campaign. And in fact, he actually, I was actually at the Houston Coliseum when he came to speak to the ministers in a different mm. form. So he spoke to the ministers saying why a Catholic could be president, making that argument. And uh, then he came to the farm. And that, w that was very exciting and, and so on. And I then followed uh, his uh, appointment of his cabinet, and then, of course, by the time he was assassinated, I was at, at Brandeis University. So that was a, a very uh, traumatic uh, incident. And I must say that 
we'll, we'll talk about the conversations in a minute, but that uh, I, as part of that, my early work in that series, I interviewed many of the important figures in his administration, including Galbraith and, and McNamara. Mm -hmm. Well, we can maybe return to that and what you learned from that and whether it changed your views of Kennedy later on. But you said you went, you just mentioned that you went to Brandeis. Uh, how was that experience? It was at a, did you, were you, was it a growing, growth experience going there from yeah, it, Galveston? It, it, yeah, it really was. And, and coming from an Orthodox Jewish community uh, and then going to uh, uh, the Jewish community's uh, gift to higher education, namely Brandeis University. It was a very exciting experience. Uh, by the way, I do want to mention one thing, although I was first generation, and I, I'm, sure I, I'm not sure I completely understand it, I never thought of myself as an immigrant. Mm -hmm. And I think that one of the reasons was that, that the boundaries and opportunities, even in Galveston, which is a declining city, were very fluid. Interestingly enough, recently the New York Times had a front page story on three uh, Mexican Americans who went to Ball High School and how they didn't rise up the, the, the ladder uh, given opportunity. And uh, so this, what, what struck me and what, when I think back about my own experience was my situation was much more fluid because I was friends with a lot of rich kids mm -hmm. and we all went to college and so on. Mm -hmm. So uh, strangely enough, I didn't hear about Brandeis from uh, um, the Jewish community, but actually my counselor showed me uh, a story about Brandeis in the Saturday Review, uh, which Norman Cousins edited. I, I can't remember if he wrote the story and that really excited me about Brandeis as a place in, the hur in a hurry. And I went there and I had this extraordinary education, which even uh, now I can fully appreciate because of some of the people who were there and who were my teachers. Herbert Marcuse, Maria mm -hmm. Serkin, Leo Kozer, uh, John Roach, uh, many of them Jewish intellectuals who had fled uh, Europe. Uh, Philip Rav also, yeah. So, and then you, came to Berkeley, but on the way to Berkeley, you found your wife, I gather. Right. In other words, what, what happened was I, I yeah. well, I didn't find her. She, maybe she, she found, found me. You. She found me or we found each other. I went to law school for you at Texas, where, I, interestingly enough, I had Charles Allen Wright, mm. who was uh, one of Nixon's lawyer, once uh, one of a great scandal broke. But yeah, we were, we were uh, set up on a blind date. We met, uh, we fell in love, and uh, uh, we've been together ever since uh, for 40 years. And, and uh, she is uh, smarter than me, wiser than me, and uh, very supportive uh, in uh, the extent to which uh, uh, my career required me to, to work at home. And then she taught in a local junior college uh, for 30 years and recently retired. Well, we know her well, and that's all true. Was Edie also from Texas originally? Yeah, she was from San Antonio. I see. So, so we both were uh, uh, Texans. And then you both came to Berkeley. Yeah, yeah. So after your uh, year at Texas Law School, and after finding your wife, you, you arrived at Berkeley to do graduate work in political science. Can you tell us some, what, what made you decide to come to the University of California at Berkeley for graduate work? Uh, well, I had had uh, Ken Waltz at Brandeis, uh, and uh, uh, he recommended Berkeley, although he wasn't here yet, and he sort of came the same year I came uh, to Berkeley. And uh, uh, I, w I was attracted by, you know, Berkeley's reputation and, uh, the, you know, its high placement in the listings of political science departments. Uh, and uh, so that's uh, what brought me here. So after several years in the political science department as a graduate student, you moved to the Institute of International Studies to be, in effect, their ex the executive director. So you know, maybe you could tell us what led you to that transition. Now I have to add for our studio audience that I was a faculty member in political science at the time, and I remember Harry as one of our best students. So he moved to the Institute of International Studies uh, not because we pushed him, and I want to make that very clear. 
So tell us, why do you uh, make that transition? Well, I, I came to Berkeley uh, interested in government and politics. And uh, as, as my career advanced, I think I, uh, I intuited, not, not a conscious decision, that, that uh, my temperament and character was such that, that I really wanted to be in a more political role than being somebody who focused on one topic uh, for extended periods. Uh, and it, it wasn't uh, where uh, my intellectual skills uh, could best be realized. And so uh, Rosberg had, uh, Carl Rosberg, an Africanist, uh, a distinguished member of the department had been chairman of the department and about this time that I was reaching this conclusion uh, I uh, he became director of the Institute of International Studies and he proposed to me uh, uh, he asked me if I would be interested in working for him uh, at the time uh, uh, the institutes at Berkeley essentially were staffed with a faculty director and with what was then called an MSO. That is a, an administrator officer who uh, tended to be women who were, were good at financial and administrative matters. And it was their rela re relationship that, you know, uh, 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 ran the program, so to speak, uh, and fulfilled the mission of the Institute. So, well, I think I was one, if not the first, uh, what later be called, was called uh, an academic coordinator. That is somebody who was intellectually sophisticated enough to understand and anticipate uh, intellectual uh, discourse and directions. And so uh, I undertook that role and found it very satisfying and have been there ever since. So this was the, uh, you arrived at the Institute in the early to middle 1970s? Right, 74. Yes. Yeah. Maybe you could sort of describe the atmosphere and the activities at the Institute in that, in that, in that period, that formative period. Well, what was uh, unique about that time was that Berkeley, in the area of international and area studies, had committed state funds to uh, these centers and institutes, uh, at which it came about because there were resources, uh, a lot of resources. And uh, so uh, the, the possibilities for doing things, once you understood the intellectual directions, uh, were, were uh, very exciting. And uh, uh, at the time that I came to the Institute, uh, the, the uh, paradigms were still in place, so to speak. By that I mean there was uh, agreement about the intellectual discourse that could take place. So, for example, the Cold War was still going strong, which meant that you could have a colloquium on comparative communism, or you could have a colloquium on uh, developing in societies, which would generate a lot of cross-disciplinary interest by faculty. So you were able to engage in activities that drew a lot of faculty in with the hope that it would uh, lead to research. So that was kind of the, the intellectual setting. The political setting was the wounds of the free speech movement, that is the battles that had been fought in the, in the 60s and over governance at the university about uh, the Vietnam War, uh, about the civil rights movement. Some of those conflicts were still, uh, although the conflicts had dissipated, the animosities had not. Mm. And so there was, uh, if you uh, undertook an activity, uh, there would always be uh, a ticking time bomb behind the curtain. And I can give you an example of that if, if, if you would like. Uh, would you like it? Yeah. Sure, I'd love it. Yeah, okay. So, uh, very early in my names. career, I was approached by <laughs> Chancellor Heyman and Nobel laureate uh, Owen Chamberlain to, uh, to run a series of forums uh, on uh, uh, the nuclear buildup in Europe. We're now moving into the early 1980s. And 
they wanted to do a series of public forums in Zellerbach that would extend over two days uh, about the, the fear and concerns because of the weapon buildup. So I uh, was put in charge of arranging uh, the program. And so we, we brought, uh, at the Chancellor's invitation, uh, from the extreme left, Petra Kelly, and from the extreme uh, right, or at least I thought it was the extreme right, Lord Carrington, the Secretary General of NATO, with in between uh, Paul <laughs> Warnke and David Owen from Great Britain. Well, so we did it. It was a great success. Several thousand people uh, attended each uh, panel. There were faculty members on each panel questioning the interview. Subsequent to that, the story broke in the local conservative student newspaper that there was nobody who could speak intelligently from the conservative point of view, which sort of blew my mind. So uh, Lord Carrington was perceived as a left winger, okay. basically, in the discourse that was still a residue uh, of both the free speech movement and, and, and feelings about the Cold War. So that, that was an example of the political environment. And, and I should say that, uh, but generally, there was a paradigm, there were resources, and that meant you could uh, start new programs. So for example, Bob, you were acting director during one of these early years, and we, you were able to start the Policy Papers series uh, at the Institute, which were monographs uh, directed to uh, important issues uh, uh, with regard to political events and public policy. And in that series, we published uh, Earl uh, Ravenall, who wrote a piece on the early demise, the unrecognized demise of NATO. We published Alexander Yanov, who was one of the leading Soviet intellectuals uh, who had fled to the United States. So, Harry, that you've just mentioned two accomplishments of yours over the past, yeah. whatever. 40 years or so, uh, that you are associated with the Institute. Maybe you could talk to us about several others. For example, I remember well the press clips, which right. you know ballooned into a major sort of institution in the and world I, of journalism. So maybe tell us a little bit about that. And let me interject and also maybe you could say a little bit about that really excellent course on American foreign policy yeah. you taught and whether you enjoyed teaching. Uh, the, the, uh, in both cases, uh, I, I found a platform or an opportunity for my uh, uh, interest. Uh, the, the first, the uh, foreign policy news clips, uh, 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 says something about my intellectual temperament and also uh, about what one did before technology changed everything. Uh, I would read about uh, 20 newspapers. Uh, all English-speaking newspapers, but from all over the world. And I would generate, a, 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 it was a clipping service in which I organized news clips about issues around particular themes. And so I did this for a number of years. I don't remember how many. It was extremely popular. First, we started doing it just for faculty. And uh, then we moved beyond that. And it, we were circulating it in Washington and to other campuses at UC. And then I would request to do it. But, but what I was able to do was master a lot of material and see nuggets of uh, information that actually would support faculty in their research, suggest ideas about future directions. And so what, what uh, before the internet, I had a hypertext mind, mm. which meant that I could jump from, the, from one reading to another and actually see how to put them together. So this was an example of the point I was trying to make before, where that the Institute was a, a great platform and an opportunity for things that actually interested me and that were suitable uh, for what for the way that my mind worked so so even after we stopped doing the clips when the, the web came along uh, I continued to to go through a lot of material uh, and that helped me understand who we should bring as visitors to the campus. So basically, I was a window for the Institute into the world out there 
and ha I developed a very strong sense of, well, if you're working on this particular topic, we should try to bring X here uh, from Europe or from wherever or find out if they were coming through. Later, after 9-11, uh, uh, the university discovered that it had uh, no courses, had not offered a course on U.S. foreign policy five years prior to the events of 9-11. So uh, Chancellor Birdall— That speaks well about the political <laughs> science department. No, that's no for, comment. We won't go there. <laughs> that's for you to say, not for me. So, so uh, Chancellor Birdall put down some money uh, uh, to teach the course, and uh, uh, no one would take the offer. <laughs> so he, he laid down some money and he said, here's this money, who will come forward? And no one came forward. And so at that point, uh, uh, I think uh, the system was going to go for a graduate student. And uh, I, I was asked if I would do it, and I said yes. And I was very prepared to, to address the topics. Since I was already on university salary, I couldn't be paid an extra amount, or that's what I was told. <laughs> and so I used the money to bring speakers. Now, what was interesting about 9-11 intellectually was the, the, the issues that it opened up really couldn't be comprehended by one discipline. And, and so I used this money to bring people from all over the world to come and give guest lectures. And then uh, I would interview them for the conversations program, which I guess we'll talk about in a minute. And uh, uh, that was an extraordinary opportunity. A, a specific example of of this is if, if you have now have terrorism, uh, if uh, one of the issues is the biological warfare, then you really need to bring somebody from public health to speak to the class uh, to talk about this. This wasn't, you know, uh, something that traditionally came within political sciences domain. In addition. Uh, one couldn't rely on international relations specialists, but you had to bring people who really understood Islam, mm -hmm. basically. Mm -hmm. And this, this involved people who either studied religion or the model, m Middle East. So what, in, in all of these endeavors, uh, in, in breaking out of disciplines and doing interdisciplinary work, uh, I was able to see the broader picture intellectually and was not uh, proprietary about uh, what I was doing in terms of, of one particular discipline. And so in the, in the course of this course, I brought an extra, I, and I was supposed to teach the course for one year yeah. and taught it for seven years. And in retrospect, uh, I brought all of the players, basically, everybody from James Dobbins, who was, uh, you know, the government's main expert uh, on the military requirements of intervention, to Steve Cole, who had written the book on Osama bin Laden and the Al Qaeda group, and uh, it was it was just an extraordinary uh, opportunity. I learned a lot, especially because I interviewed everybody who came, and and it's important to recall that the. The class size was from 200 to 250. In fact, we had to close the class. And it was interdisciplinary. So what I got was a lot of science students mm -hmm. who basically you know, didn't have the time in their curriculum to, uh, uh, to actually take political science uh, courses. These were often graduate students and not uh, just uh, undergraduates. And uh, so it was... Uh, uh, an extraordinary opportunity. And again, it proves my point that when there are resources, uh, as you know at IGS, Jack, you know, there's a you lot can you can things. accomplish. Yes. Yeah. Well, one of the things that impressed me in this uh, colloquy and also knowing what you were doing was the relations that you built up with uh, people from other countries. And that led to uh, various kinds of interactions, meetings. Uh, we three took a trip to China together as a result of uh, your relations with an important foreign policy institute there. Was this something that you tried to do self-consciously or? 
Yeah, in other words, what, 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 uh, what, what happened is uh, 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 that uh, these various activities, strangely enough, even the clipping service, because I would send the clipping service to somebody who was not here, say they were in Washington, D.C., and they were very impressed, and they, they would feel that they owed me something in return. So then when I invited them to come here, uh, it, it was very easy to get them. So they weren't just coming for the money or the prestige of Berkeley. It, w it was a, an entree point. They might have come anyway, but, you know, I don't know. But the same was true of the course. And uh, as a result, uh, so, for example, in the case of uh, the course uh, and, and the various work I was doing at the Institute, I had met Tom Ferrer. You, you will recall him, Bob, he, who was an a, a international lawyer who worked on uh, the Horn of Africa. And uh, uh, as a result, through him, I built up this Chinese connection. But in, in terms of the course and the interviews, I mean, uh, uh, in, in, I met an extraordinary number of people. And so I have a, a very uh, fat Rolodex, uh, which allows me to invite people who will come. So I mean, uh, everybody from Neil Kinnock, uh, 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 Sir uh, 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 Chris Patton uh, to uh, to uh, uh, Europeans uh, to uh, uh, all sorts of people from Washington and so on. So it was weird. I, I suddenly had all of these connections, but you know I was just the executive director of of this institute, uh, working away mainly with faculty. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned the interviews and, of course, a major contribution of yours over the last years since you started this program has been these conversations, which have a tremendously wide reach now. And you've got a book about them. Uh, tell me how, how did you come to do this and who were your role models? How did you educate yourself? to do it as well as you've been doing it? Well, uh, growing up in Galveston, uh, there, were, there, were, uh, there was one big cultural center, which was the Rosenberg Library. So every Saturday, I would go there uh, and read uh, all sorts of things, uh, occasionally run into the rabbi who would question me about things. Uh, 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 but uh, on television, uh, uh, on, on, there, were, there were two programs that I watched religiously. One was Edward R. Murrow's Person to Person, and the other was Walter Cronkite's You Are There. Uh, Cronkite's program was a reenactment of historical events where he, as the moderator and host, would interview actors playing uh, people who were assuming roles, say, at the assassination of of President Lincoln or the signing of the Declaration of Independence. So I, I had watched those programs. I mentioned the interview that I did in, in high school. I was a, an editor of uh, the Justice at, at Brandeis University. Uh, so the story goes like this. We were doing uh, a closed faculty luncheon uh, at the time of the Reagan buildup of nuclear weapons. Uh, Bob, you were there. I actually have a picture of you at this thing. And, and there were like four Nobel laureates. Linus Pauling was there. He had two Nobel Prizes. Charles Towns was there. Owen Chamberlain. Herb York, not a Nobel laureate, but the ambassador to the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty. And we were having this very interesting discussion about nuclear weapons and the arms buildup. And so it sort of struck me that this was a shame that the public didn't participate in this. And so uh, I, I learned that there was a studio here, and I got the idea. Uh, in fact, I think the studio had once come to me about taping uh, lectures. And I said, ah, I thought that was boring. And uh, so uh, uh, I said, what about doing an interview? And that was the. The, the beginning of the program, and uh, I, I should say that what made, there were two things that made this an unbelievable ex success, and then I'll explain to you how I did it. One was Berkeley is an amazing place, so the the traffic coming through here uh, of the you know intellectual and policy titans of the world is is quite amazing. 
so, th so that was one thing. So it was a question of, of, of pricking low-hanging fruit, basically. The problem was that these people would come and speak to a department or speak to you know, larger audiences, but everything was really shaped by the missile silos, which is what departments are, which meant that if you went to an event, oftentimes it would just be people from a narrow circle who knew who this was. So uh, uh, that was a flaw uh, uh, built in to where creativity comes at the university. So, uh, uh, so I realized that, hey, the way to do this is to interview these people. And so I started finding out what people's schedules were and walking them over to this studio. Now, as I started this thing, one of the first things that the television office asked me was uh, the following. They said, would you like to edit these interviews? And so I said, well, what's involved? And they said, money, because you have to pay for the editor. And so I didn't have a budget for this. So uh, what, what uh, I came to realize was that if I prepared extensively, and by prepare extensively, I mean put in uh, two hours, anywhere from two hours to 10 hours into preparing for the interview. So uh, that was a very important thing that I learned. Now, Because then I, you would have less to edit. Yeah, I would have, and I would know where to go. And so uh, then the, the next thing uh, that I intuited, and I think this was because of Edward R. Murrow, was that people would be interested in personal details, not, you know, did you hate your parents or whatever, but really, you know, what were the background factors that influenced you uh, in, in embracing a set of ideas? So what the, the goal of the series became, one hour interview, unedited, I'm well prepared, a conversation about ideas, but where did the ideas come from? What are the ideas? How did you come to embrace them? What factors influenced you? And then what were the consequences of these ideas? And uh, 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 what advice could you give to students based on what you learned in your career? The, the, the final element in all of this was technology. And I, I'm, I'm not a, 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 a techno nerd. Uh, basically. In fact, I didn't uh, understand in the beginning what was happening. But as I did presentations based on the interviews, uh, uh, I realized uh, I was approached by people from uh, computer science, Larry Rowe in particular, and he said, would you like to put this video on the web? And I said, sure, but I didn't know what he meant, <laughs> basically. And he was developing some of the technology to uh, to put video on the web. And so very early, uh, I got my stuff on the web. And there's another story here that tells you about some of the problems of the university, which I can tell you in a minute. But, but that was the launching of the series. And this combination of all of these things, preparation, you know, talking about your background, you know, what, what have you done? Who are you? Uh, made people very good interviewees because mm -hmm. they were shocked that I knew that much about them and what they had done. So in a way, I got into the guest's head mm -hmm. and they were comfortable with me. And I'm not a, uh, an adversarial interviewer. And, and that's what uh, made the uh, program such a success. And because it was on the web, basically everybody was watching right. it and we didn't even know it. And so getting back to your question about China, uh, the story goes, I was at a conference in China. A student was placing the nameplates on the table. And so she comes to me and, you know, we were sitting randomly and she put, she put my nameplate at the thing. And so I said to this Chinese student at the University of Beijing, how do you know who I am? And she said, oh, I watch you all the time. <laughs> so th this program became very popular with Chinese students. Well, Harry, do you remember the first interview? Who was your first interview? Yeah, my first interview was with Manfred Lanstein, who was one of uh, the, the, uh, the chancellor of Germany's top assistants, Helmut Kohl. And I'm uh, not, sorry, not Helmut Kohl, uh, his predecessor, the Social Democrat. 
uh, I should remember. Uh, Brent? Uh, no, not after Brent. Uh, uh, but who? Earhart? No, not Earhart. <laughs> it was, we were all, uh, uh, I'll think of it in a second. Uh, and actually, I did the interview with Jerry Feldman, because at that time, uh, I was doing the interviews with faculty. But in, in the end, over time, I realized that it was better not to use faculty. <laughs> Um, so he was the first, and how many, roughly, have you done? Well, I've done 555. And this and is I, the 556th. Th no, this is the 555th. Ah. And I, the 554th was with uh, Vicente Fox, yes. who I did on Friday. Right. Uh, and, uh, yeah. So let's ask you, you know, here's the former president of Mexico, prominent person. How did he happen to get into your studio? Uh, well, he, he didn't come here to Berkeley. I was approached by De Anza College and the Osher Lifelong Learning Institute. He was coming to De Anza as part of a prestigious lecture series. So, so they asked me if I wanted to interview him. So I'm, I'm pretty well known, mm -hmm. and I'm somebody who, who can do an interview. Uh, and, and he was asked if he would do it. I've done so many well-known people now that when I ask him if he would do it, send him a letter, I can list... Uh, his peer group, uh, of whom I've already interviewed. So I had interviewed uh, 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 Kenneth Kaunda. Uh, I've actually interviewed the president of uh, uh, Italy, uh, uh, Giorgio Napolitano. Of course, I interviewed him a while back when he was a Euro communist, mm -hmm. <laughs> which is something he probably would like to forget. So, but it's so, on record. <laughs> yeah, that's right. So, so you you can actually generate a list of very prominent people, uh, and uh, and it, it, I would like to say something about this interview. It was very interesting because, you know, he comes in. He he sort of knows I do this. But, but I was actually, by really being well informed about his very interesting background, uh, he really opened up to an extraordinary extent because his family history really helps you understand why he's such a Mexican nationalist, but also a kind of citizen of the world who really believes in globalization. So if you think, Harry, back to all these interviews, what sta which one stands out as your most interesting interview? Well, there, that's hard. It's like picking between your children, basically. <laughs> but but uh, uh, there are many for different reasons. Uh, and in fact, right right now, I'm I'm editing some of them to to actually take out clips. And the the woman, the person who stands out is actually Elizabeth Warren, and for two reasons. One is she she when I interviewed her, she wasn't well known except in academic circles. Uh, and so she's really taken off. And I was, by preparing for that interview, I really came to understand her insights, her insights about the collapse of the middle class. And this was before this was kind of generally realized. It was before 2008. It, there were some, you know, academic studies here that were pointing to this whole issue of, of inequality in the United States. But she was really into it and could really articulate it. So she was one of the leading figures. Secondly, she was a woman. And m my one regret is I haven't interviewed as many women because it turns out that a lot of the speakers that uh, the campus brings in the past have not been women. They're more and more women. So this is kind of the breaking of, of the glass uh, ceiling. Uh, and so she stands out for one set of reasons. Robert McNamara stands out for another set of reasons. What, what I discover in doing these interviews is you really get a fix on somebody by studying them, leading them through their early background years, and then getting them to talk about issues. And what was interesting about McNamara, he was a Regents lecturer. I went around and listened to him, part of the preparation. And what I discovered was this guy was a, a liberal who basically had gone to Berkeley, was very influenced by the Depression and how it uh, affected fellow students here. He said, I had a friend who committed, his father committed suicide because of the Depression. So this guy was an old time Johnson, uh, Johnson Roosevelt liberal. And so it, it was really fascinating. Now, now there were two things. One is by preparing, 
one of the things that struck me was why hadn't this guy stayed at Harvard? He was teaching at Harvard before he went to the Ford Motor Company. And so I said to him, you know, just part of what I have going for me is my naivete. So I said, why did you leave Harvard? And he said, well, my wife and I got polio and I needed the money. Well, I sort of sat up and that was not publicly known, mm. you know, before I did this mm -hmm. interview. The other thing about McNamara, which makes his interview very interesting, is this guy would dominate or attempt to dominate the conversation. So if you ask him, well, Mr. McNamara, I didn't ask him this, but an example, what do you think of today's weather? And then his answer would be, well, you're really asking me three questions <laughs> there. And then he would articulate three questions and, and then answer. answer his three questions. So, so he really, he really uh, stands out. And uh, over time, you know, it, it's very hard to pick, but, but it, it's just been an extraordinary opportunity for me. Well, you mentioned earlier that uh, McNamara is an example that your interest in Kennedy and uh, sense that would the world have been different had he lived uh, was partly guided your selection at least of some of the earlier uh, uh, interviewees. So having done those and now reflecting back, uh, what, is, what are your thoughts about what you've learned about Kennedy and that administration and was his promise overrated? Do you still feel as as enthusiastic as you did growing up? Well, no. <laughs> so, so basically, because I've learned, you know, from my studies in political science, and from my studies as 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 the host and moderator and interviewer of uh, of uh, conversation, I've learned an awful lot, basically. And so I've come to understand the the importance of political culture, you know, through political science. Uh, 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 the, the, the complexity of organizational structures, basically, working at the university, uh, and the, the, uh, the, the difference between words and deeds, basically. And so the, the combination of all of uh, these uh, factors uh, led me to actually kind of understand things in a, in a, in a, uh, in a way that's very sophisticated. I, I make the following joke. I say what I do in conversations is I prepare for a final exam, basically. But the difference is I question the professor mm. when I do the interview. And uh, over time, what has happened, so I uh, have contacts all over the campus who then tell me about people who are coming. And one of the most extraordinary examples of this and the greatest opportunity is I interview all the graduate division lecturers, and the graduate dean pays for those uh, interviews. Not my, not me, but you know the cost of uh, the filming and so on. So what what I am the beneficiary of is academic committees. There must be eight lectureships, distinguished lectureships, everything from the Jefferson to the Hitchcock, which in which faculty committees that are interdisciplinary are picking the leading figures in all these disciplines and I'm interviewing every one of the speakers. I'm programmed into their schedule. So this means I interview Nobel laureates, I interview scientists, I interview presidents of universities. So it's just this extraordinary opportunity where I'm being exposed. I, I, not only did I escape from uh, uh, the missile silo, but I built a castle, you know, an intellectual castle where all of these people come and talk to me about their discoveries, their creative processes, you know, what they actually did, uh, and so on. And so as a result, no, uh, I've, I've, I've left the old heroes and found new ones. But I remain a kid at heart, otherwise I couldn't do what I'm doing. Well. You know, Harry, uh, you are retiring from your position at the Institute, but you are going to continue with these conversations, we hope. Yes, I am, definitely. And uh, 
you have the opportunity, since you won't have a boss from within the university anymore, now to tell us uh, maybe what all of these experiences suggest to you about things the university could do better in terms of uh, communicating you know, the range of intellectual discourse to its students and others. I mean, you've mentioned silos before, and you've talked about how you've been able to break out of those silos. Uh, what, 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 would your, what would your advice be, say, to us as people in the research community here and how we go about doing our work and communicating it? That's a tough question. Uh, I grew up uh, at the university in a world that sort of no longer exists in the sense the resources aren't there. And I think that when the resources weren't there, the university would commit resources to uh, uh, doing interdisciplinary uh, uh, work. Uh, I'm talking primarily now about the social sciences. The sciences are different. and. Uh, that required money, uh, intellectual talent to go for this, but also the staff to implement those programs. And uh, whether the university uh, will continue doing that uh, is an open question, or at least it has to figure out new ways to do it. And I think that part of the problem is their reference group becomes uh, the corporation and the business sector. Mm -hmm. And so the question becomes, how do you say, well, the business community supposedly is more efficient, and it probably is, but how does that interface with the intellectual enterprise? And I think that there is more of a conflict there than the, the people who are running the university uh, may realize. And so the consequences are, as you cut back staff, you demoralize the people who are left. And one of the key elements of uh, what I did, what it, the administrative people at the institute did, was these were very conscientious people in, in most instances basically who would put in that extra hour, even on their own time, even if they weren't paid, who would implement and follow through in a way that made the system work. And so you can quantify, you can computerize, you can create automaticity, but the question is, will the system work as well? And will it be able to, to essentially go for the play that is an opening into the future, you know, basically, which, which involves a, a kind of intellectual way of seeing things that's entirely different from what emerges as one particular discipline. Because as you have fewer resources, you may be putting money into doing it the way we were doing it, namely in the departments, and then uh, departments have a tendency to replicate themselves, and the, the DNA might not be as adaptive as it should be. Well, we have time, I think, for a couple more questions. Uh, well, let me ask you just to follow up on that. Uh, how is conversations with history finance, and is this something that you thought that you needed to go out and get philanthropic contributions just for your particular Well, well I've been program. fortunate in, in the sense that I have been supported by units. So, for example, the Institute supported me through all of these, and it continues to support me in doing this. Uh, then, uh, as has your Institute for a select number, and has the graduate dean, and then on occasion when, when other uh, departments have uh, uh, supported uh, me because I would interview a, a, a particular uh, individual that they had brought to the campus. In addition, uh, people have approached me. Uh, in the beginning, <clears throat> the people who were developing video on the web, they didn't have any content. So they embraced me, came to me, and said, 
you know, we'll put this up for you. And then uh, people at UC San Diego got a large uh, National Science Foundation grant which wanted to use my content and which, you know, provided some support for me. So, uh, and you know, then uh, the television office here in the past has been supportive uh, of what I what uh, uh, I've been doing. So, so I've I, my my success has been the success of the program and my seeing uh, that uh, that uh, you know where opportunities exist uh, and uh, you know I am the wonderkind when it comes to figuring out what to do with that distinguished visitor between the hours of two and three <laughs> before the lecture when nobody uh, wants it. Didn't want it. Well, good. Bob, do you want to kind of wind up here for us? So other than, than conversations, you have uh, any other plans for your uh, quasi-retirement? Well, I'm, I'm actually, one thing related to conversations, I'm actually going into the archive now. Uh, I, I uh, went to Apple and took my course and learned iMovie, and I'm able to go in and uh, edit uh, uh, some of my interviews, which I refuse to let anybody else do, <laughs> and, and pick out, create a conversation within the conversations between uh, uh, people I've interviewed about things like the Vietnam War, creativity and science and so on. Uh, so you'll, I, you'll pull from different interviews? Yeah, I mean, I, yeah. Topic, so, right? so for example, I'm, I'm creating a little video for my retirement party and uh, one, one thing I'm playing with is creativity in the sciences. So I interviewed Linus Pauling, I interviewed Sir John Gearden who just won the Nobel Prize for being the, the founding father of stem cell research and I interviewed uh, uh, Victor Weisskopf, who actually was one of the leading, the and and it, a moment in their interview, we discussed this, and so you can ab able to put these things together, and and it's it's really uh, uh, fascinating. So I'll continue doing interviews, continue, you know, preparing for the interviews, and you know, we'll do some traveling too. But we'll still be seeing you on campus often, I hope. Yes, I, I think I'm keeping my office, and I will be here to bug the television office and uh, interact with uh, colleagues such as yourself. Well, Harry, just have to say that uh, we all owe you a great debt for your career here. You've done many important things for the Berkeley campus, and certainly conversations with history, as you've explained, has a global reach. And it's, uh, we congratulate you and thank you very much for agreeing yourself to be a guest on Conversations with History. And, and thank you, Jack, for having me <laughs> on my program. <laughs> and thank you, Bob, also. All right. Very good.